Oral questions, question oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Fifty-eight percent capacity. That's what the Public Health Agency of Canada says the vaccine rollout is operating at because we don't have the supply to do more. It was operating at close to zero when the third wave started building in January and February. Why does this Prime Minister think that 58% is good enough for Canadians? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are working closely with the provinces and territories to support them in their responsibility of delivering vaccine, uh, administering vaccines. We've sent more than 13.6 million vaccines to provinces and territories, with millions more arriving in the weeks and months to come. Uh, we know that in the month of May, there are at least 2 million Pfizer vaccines uh, and more of others coming in every single week. Uh, and in the month of June, there will be tens of millions coming in. Uh, that's why it's important that the provinces be ready as they are for the ramp up as we move forward on getting everybody vaccinated. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. More will be coming when the countries that had a plan are finished vaccinating their population, Mr. Speaker. We're in a race against variants in this third wave, and we're losing because we didn't have the vaccines needed in January and in February. In fact, we still don't. But the Prime Minister is now not even restricting flights from COVID hotspots to stop the entry of new dangerous variants. The Prime Minister failed at the border last year. Why is he failing again? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, we've delivered more than 13.6 million doses of vaccines to provinces and territories. We actually uh, passed by about 50 per cent our targets of delivering 6 million vaccines by the end of March, and we will continue to deliver more and more vaccines to get Canadians through this. Uh, on the borders, we have some of the strongest measures in the world on the borders, uh, but we will also continue to look at other ways based on science and data to keep Canadians Canadians safe. Uh, importation from the border is a fraction uh, of the cases we're coming in, but we will still uh, make sure we are doing everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. The Leader of the Opposition. It's a sad day, Mr. Speaker, when a Canadian Prime Minister celebrates making his targets by stealing vaccines from the developing world. And no vaccines in January or in February means we're having a third wave in April. No border measures immediately means that the third wave could last until June. The Americans have introduced new border measures, Mr. Speaker, against Canada because of the lack of control of variants by this Prime Minister. Right. What is it going to take for Canadians to finally see action on COVID from this Prime Minister. The right honourable Prime Minister. First of all, Mr. Speaker, once again, we see Conservatives uh, peddling falsehoods when they say no vaccines in January or February. That's simply not true, Mr. Speaker. We have to continue to deliver. We've continued to increase our vaccine supplies, and we actually uh, went uh, well beyond the predicted targets. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we see once again uh, the Conservatives uh, aren't asking any questions about the budget. Why? Uh, because they must support it. They must think it is excellent because they recognize how targeted it is for Canadians, how it's going to get us through this COVID recession, how it's going to build back better. Thank the Conservatives for their support. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I have a question about the budget. We're in the third wave and variants are out of control. That's a fact. Canadians are tired of this. The Prime Minister has promised to increase health transfers to the provinces, but only after the pandemic. He is sending water after the fire. Why is the Prime Minister neglecting the provinces again when they need help now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Conservative leader it only asks budget questions in French. There must be some reason for that, but let's move on. And then he keeps saying anything and everything. Thousands, billions of dollars have been transferred to the 
provinces to help them with their health care systems during the pandemic. And with this budget, we're sending another $4 billion to the provinces and territories. We are there for Canadians, despite the Conservatives who keep saying we're spending too much, we should spend less, uh, we shouldn't be there for Canadians to the same extent. But we will always be there to support Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. leader. The provinces need a leader, not uh, a, a talker. Last year, the Prime Minister failed to shut down the borders because he didn't have a plan to slow down the virus. Yesterday, the U.S. took new steps at the border because of how slow this government has been in stopping the variants. We are fully into a third wave here, and the Prime Minister is always slow to slow things down in the hot zones. What's he waiting for? Why isn't he taking action? Five questions today, Mr. Speaker, from the opposition leader, and in each question, he made facts up. I understand that it's the responsibility of members of parliament to debate here, but when he says things like the U.S. have just changed their position on Canada, that's quite simply false. Since November, Mr. Speaker, the United States has been expressing concerns with a number of countries, including Canada, and that's still the case. But the Conservatives are simply uh, peddling falsehoods to play politics, and that's not the way things should be done. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of uh, things said in English versus French, the Prime Minister promised in English to increase long-term health transfers to the provinces, and that's good news. But... We, we need that now. When you look at the budget, it's nowhere to be found. So my question is quite straightforward. Is the increase in health transfers going to happen now, and will it reach 35% of the costs? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the bloc leader has obviously forgotten this, but in November we had a meeting with all the provincial premiers and territorial premiers. And I said clearly at that point that, yes, we would be there to increase health transfers in the long term, but only once we're through this pandemic. And while we're in the pandemic, we will continue to be there with billions of dollars to support the provinces, $19 billion for recovery, $4 billion just now in the budget for health transfers and all the help they need now. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Mr. Speaker, in the Prime Minister's mind, the pandemic is going to last another five years or more, I guess. The National Assembly of Quebec passed a unanimous resolution repeating its um, previous resolution, rejecting national standards for long-term care and calling for an increase in health transfers to 35 percent of the cost. And they're condemning the fact that there's nothing about this in the budget. So it's not just me, it's not just the bloc, it's the Quebec Premier and the National Assembly unanimously. You know, right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, all Canadians and Quebecers are concerned about the fate of our seniors all across the country. They recognize that all seniors in the country need to be able to have a decent retirement, a safe, secure retirement. And that's precisely why we're working with the provinces and territories to ensure that our seniors have a safe, secure, protected retirement, whether it's in long-term care or elsewhere. We are respecting provincial jurisdiction, but we are moving forward to ensure that all seniors are protected. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. A doctor in Ontario wrote to the Prime Minister urging the Prime Minister to invoke the Emergencies Act and to step in and help. She writes that the situation is so bad in Ontario that not only COVID-19 patients, but any patient seeking health care is limited in the health care they can receive. She wrote again specifically, how angry would you be if your loved one had a heart attack and there was no hospital or ICU bed for them? Will the Prime Minister declare a public welfare emergency and immediately get the help 
uh, that people need, getting vaccines to those who need it most. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, the federal government is there to help all Canadians. We have your backs. That's why uh, we have indicated to the Government of Ontario that we are there to provide more sorts, whether it's Red Crosses, uh, whether it's more vaccine doses, uh, whether it's uh, investments uh, in health care and supports. We will continue to be there to support Canadians right across the country. I find it interesting, however, that, uh, uh, that uh, the NDP is now calling on us to invoke the Emergencies Act uh, uh, when Tommy Douglas famously criticized my father for doing the same thing. Uh, we believe in working with the provinces and delivering concretely, that's what we're going to continue to do. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister knows that it's a completely different act, and the Prime Minister knows that having someone's back means actually stepping in, helping, not standing back and watching. Radhika from the Greater Toronto Area lost her father to COVID-19. Her father worked for 26 years in the same factory in the Greater Toronto Area before getting COVID-19, getting sick, and then dying. She says that the way forward is to make sure people have paid sick leave. So will the Prime Minister, if he believes he can have people's backs, will he improve access to paid sick leave and protect workers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the tragedies faced by far too many Canadian families over these past many months have been heartbreaking. And every step of the way, governments have been there to support people. We are, uh, we've been working hand in glove uh, with provincial and territorial governments. We've been delivering direct supports to families. Uh, and we know, Mr. Speaker, there continues to be more to do. We move forward with paid sick leave to make sure that people didn't have to face the impossible choice uh, between going to work uh, or putting food on the table. And we will continue to work to do more. Uh, we know people need uh, us to continue to have have their backs, and we will. L'honorable député de Louis. The honorable member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, in January, February, Canada went through a vaccine drought, and the result is being felt today. Because of that drought, which is the prime minister's fault, the third wave is hitting much harder than it is elsewhere here in Canada. And the prime minister is telling people not to travel. But the Prime Minister recently said he was getting ready to go to Great Britain this summer. Mr. Speaker, why does the Prime Minister say one thing and do the opposite? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we can see the Conservatives are having to look pretty far afield to find attacks. I do hope to be able to attend the G7 Heads of Government meeting in person in June, but obviously it will depend heavily on the situation we're in. That's precisely what I've said. We will be responsible. We will continue to work with our counterparts around the world to get through this crisis. It's a global crisis. And to get the economic recovery started, which is so important to everyone. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Yeah, if we want to look for examples, look at look abroad. CNN said recently that the government had recently failed Canadians who deserve better. That's the foreign opinion of the Prime Minister's management of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Boris Johnson had to correct the Prime Minister because the Prime Minister falsely asserted that they had a serious problem right now in Great Britain. This Prime Minister has not dealt with the vaccine problem properly in January and February. Can he at least admit that, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? When it comes to health care, we'll take no lessons from the Conservatives. They said that we wouldn't be in a position to deliver uh, vaccines as early as we have. Uh, we do recognize that there is still work to be done, nonetheless. 25% of Canadians have now been vaccinated. We've hit that mark, but we have to do better. And in the weeks to come, in May, we will receive over 2 million vaccines per week. And we will continue to increase the rhythm because we're working very hard on that every day. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, Canadians remember that in December 2020, 
The Prime Minister was proud to put on a display about vaccine orders, but in January and February there was a 10-day vaccine drought. No vaccines arrived, and now the third wave is hitting much harder in Canada than elsewhere because the Prime Minister created losing conditions in Canada, and that's making Canadians suffer. Can the Prime Minister admit that he has fallen down on the job, and he did so in January and February? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker... It's time to talk facts. We promised Canadians we would receive 6 million doses, vaccine doses, in the first three months, the first quarter of 2020, and we exceeded that by 50%. We got more than 9 million doses in the first quarter. Mr. Speaker, we are exceeding our projections, but we do acknowledge that there's much more work to be done and we will continue working around the clock to deliver more and more vaccines to get us through this pandemic. Donan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, 4,000 Manitoba essential workers will be fully vaccinated months earlier than the Prime Minister planned, thanks to the kindness and generosity of the North Dakota people. Manitoba truckers will receive both recommended doses, two doses within a short six-week period, while transporting goods to the United States. Full credit to Manitoba's Premier for his visionary leadership on this. But will the Prime Minister admit it is in fact his vaccine shortages that caused the third wave of the pandemic and encouraged multiple Premiers to go cap in hand to the Governor of North Dakota? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I think, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives would do well to pay a little more attention to science rather than grounding everything in their partisan attacks. Uh, but I'd like to remind the Honourable Member that we've worked every step of the way with the provinces and territories through this pandemic, including on procuring and supplying them with vaccines. Provinces are free to make their own decisions on who should be prioritized for vaccination. We're happy to see the province of Manitoba is making essential workers like, like truckers a priority. And as I've said many times, every can Canadian who wants to will be fully vaccinated by September. The Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, what the Prime Minister would do well to remember is the third wave is raging in Canada and Canadians are tired of waiting for vaccines. We're seeing dual citizens in Ontario crossing the U.S. border to get vaccinated. vaccinated. Many Canadians know snowbirds who have done the same. Everyone but the Prime Minister can see the U.S. and the U.K. success has allowed them to begin reopening. And yet Canada has resorted to taking vaccines from developing nations and in international embarrassment. Canadians deserve far better than this Prime Minister's mediocrity. And will he admit his failures to deliver enough vaccines in January and February led to the third wave of the pandemic in Canada. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, in instead of talking down the hardworking Canadians across the country in provinces, territories and in the federal government who have been working unbelievably hard to get people vaccinated, uh, they should respect and reflect on the fact that Canada is now third in the G20 in terms of uh, uh, people who have been vaccinated. In terms of the G7, we are also third, behind the US and the UK indeed, but ahead of many of our European counterparts. We will continue to do even better. We will continue to bring in even more vaccines because we know uh, that vaccination and science is the way through uh, this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is serious. People are getting sicker and they're dying. Provinces are heading back into the third wave of the pandemic lockdowns. ICUs are overwhelmed. Field hospitals are being built in Ontario. A Vancouver nurse is asking for prayers because the situation is worse than she's ever seen. She's seeing people as young as 20 years old in her ICU, Mr. Speaker. And Canadians are frustrated, they are tired, and it's costing more Canadian lives and livelihoods. This, this is the COVID-19 legacy of this Prime Minister. Will he show humility for once and acknowledge that it is his failures to get vaccines to Canada adequately in January and February that led to the third wave of the pandemic and is costing Canadian lives. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, on this we can agree. Canadians are tired of this COVID pandemic. People are frustrated about the restrictions that continue. But we need to get through this as quickly and as best as possible. And that is why we are working day and night to bring in even more uh, vaccine doses so we can end with this pandemic. In the meantime, we're going to need to continue to follow local public health guidelines. And we actually, as a federal government, brought in measures so that premiers across the country could uh, make the tough decisions around closing down uh, various sectors of 
the economy, knowing that the federal government was there to support workers, to support small businesses, to have Canadians' backs. The Honourable Member for Belleau Assembly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A judgment was finally delivered recognizing the viability and the legitimacy of the National Assembly. But it removed a part of Quebec from the National Assembly's jurisdiction. Quebec will obviously appeal that decision. Does the Prime Minister recognize Quebec's jurisdiction and does he undertake not to finance those who oppose it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, obviously we're aware of the decision. We will allow the court process to follow its course and we continue to monitor the situation closely. The Honourable Member for Belleau et Chambly. Well, it's going to take a bit more than that, so let's do some reading. The National Assembly would like to remind everyone that the Quebec nation never signed on to the Constitution in 1982 when it was brought home by the Excuse me, I'm just going to have to interrupt you for a second. Someone has their microphone on, and so I would ask everyone to put their mics on mute. Put their mics on mute, et on va laisser... Uh... And we'll allow the uh, Honourable Member for belle Chambly to start over again. So for the sake of the Prime Minister, I'm going to do some reading here. The National Assembly points out that the Quebec Nation never agreed to the repatriation of the Constitution in 1982 by the Government of Canada. The Quebec Nation can establish its own rules with res respect of its culture of institutions. All Quebecers are equal before the law, and all laws passed by the National Assembly apply throughout Quebec. Once again, that's a unanimous motion 100% of MNAs in Quebec passed this motion. Will the Prime Minister respect Quebecers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are obviously aware of the court decision. We will allow the legal process to follow its course, and we will monitor the situation closely. Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I can't get over this because the Prime Minister's standing in question period today, while millions of Ontarians are under lockdown again, the third wave is raging, and he's speculating about his own international travel. Like, I guess international travel, it's not the time for that unless it's FOMO for the Prime Minister missing out on a cocktail party or some sort of photo op. The reality is, is that by the end of February, only 5% of Canadians had received even their first shot. That's unconscionable. Will the Prime Minister admit that if he had... Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The reality is Canadians have now uh, been... 25% uh, of Canadians have uh, uh, received at least uh, their first shot of the vaccines. And uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to start getting oh, more than 2 million vaccines every single week. And those numbers are going to keep going up. Uh, we know how important this is. Uh, on the issue of international travel, it is uh, amazing to see the lengths to which the Conservative Party will go to make attacks. I highlighted that uh, I was hoping to attend the G7 uh, heads of government's meeting uh, in June in Cornwall uh, to work on the global recovery, uh, but uh, the Conservatives uh, certainly uh, can't have any of that. The Honourable Member for Calgary Nose Hill. You know what? There's a lot of Canadians who want to travel to go to funerals, to visit ailing loved ones but they're not having any of that. And that's because the Prime Minister only delivered enough for 5% of Canadians to get their first dose of vaccine within the first two months of the year, that critical time when we could have stopped the first wave. He spent last summer covering up the we scandal and shutting down Parliament instead of negotiating contracts that could have gotten us those vaccines. Will he admit that his failure to procure vaccines in January and February led to the third wave? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, again, we have now passed the, uh, the threshold of having vaccinated 25 per cent of Canadians, and we need uh, to continue to do more, and that uh, is something we're going to continue to do. In terms of uh, the opportunities for the global community to come together, and particularly the leaders of the seven largest economies, uh, as I said, it is not certain, but I am hopeful to be able to sit with them in person, and I would, I would do it wherever it was, whether it was in Cornwall, whether it was held in Oklahoma. I would be there uh, to be there for the G7. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. You know, the Prime Minister can mock his international travel against people who need to travel to see ailing loved ones who are separated with their families, but that's not going to cut it. He st cites statistics, but one statistic is fact. Only 2% of Canadians, 2% have been fully vaccinated. That's abysmal. That's not going to stop the third wave. There's not enough supply. We're having to administer first shots of vaccines off-label for four months because he didn't produce enough vaccines. We could have stopped the first wave if he had gotten us vaccines in January and February, but he didn't. Why? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, the Conservatives demonstrate that they'll never let the facts get in the way of a good political partisan attack. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, is we have been working diligently and indeed experts uh, and the National Advisory Council on Immunization uh, made a recommendation that Canada follow a two, uh, a, a one dose strategy uh, with a larger uh, stretch point between the two doses so that uh, we could ensure more Canadians are protected. Those decisions are grounded in science, uh, and even the Conservative health critic has to recognize that rather than make partisan attacks. Honourable Member for Calgary Knows Hill. It's just ridiculous. It's off-label. No other country is separating doses by four months. Only Canada, because he didn't get us enough vaccines. Fact, two, only 2% 2 of Canadians are fully vaccinated. Fact, only 5% were fully vaccinated by the end of January. That's his partisan fault. Enough with the partisan games. He didn't get us these vaccines. Now we're in the third wave. Now ICUs are overflowing, and it's because he didn't negotiate these contracts. Why didn't we have enough vaccines in January in February for shame. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I don't want to tell the uh, health critic for the Conservative Party how to do her job, but if she actually looked around, uh, the, uh, the uh, UK was actually the first country to expand that four-month spread strategy and as a way of getting more people protected as quickly as possible. So that is a strategy that Canadian uh, scientists and experts have recommended, and that is what we are continuing to do. Uh, we have now passed the threshold of 25 per cent of Canadians vaccinated. We have millions more vaccines coming in uh, in the coming months, uh, coming weeks and months. And we look forward to getting through this pandemic by working together. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, people are still faced with the impossible choice of going into work sick or staying at home and not getting pay because this Prime Minister refuses to fix the paid sick leave. The Ontario Science Table agrees Paid sick leave saves lives. Yet the Prime Minister continues to refuse to improve access to the paid sick leave. He's not listening to the scientists. He's not listening to workers. He's not listening to families who have lost loved ones. What will it take for the Prime Minister to improve access to paid sick leave and save workers? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, we have had Canadians backs with unprecedented supports for workers, for families, for small businesses, for seniors, for young people, uh, and we have continued to do that. Uh, on, in discussions with the provinces and territories at the end of last summer, we moved forward with two weeks of paid sick leave, knowing that it would make a big difference across the country, and we continue uh, to work on that. We expanded it to four weeks. We also recognize that the provinces themselves have a role to play, and uh, I hope a number of them will continue to step up on paid sick leave. Uh, there is a work for all of us to do, but eight out of every ten dollars to support Canadians came from the federal government. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has finally presented a budget with emblematic amounts. Well, congratulations, but the Prime Minister forgot an urgent request from provinces and territories. They asked for an increase in health transfers. We're in the midst of a crisis. 
a health crisis. Our health system has to be able to meet people's needs. Can the Prime Minister commit to increase health transfers, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I committed to do this last December when I had a conversation and a meeting with the Premiers. But I also recognized that right now we have serious needs in our health system, and that's why we transferred billions of dollars additionally to the provinces and territories so that we could get through this pandemic. And once this crisis will be over, we will sit down and we'll determine how we'll be able to continue to increase health transfers in the long term. Yes, Mr. Speaker, that's what we're going to do. Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, the global pandemic has been tough on all Canadians, but particularly on women who tend to be the family caregivers, especially during a crisis. And research Many women have had to exit the workforce, risking decades of women's hard-fought gains in the workplace. And we know this is often due to a lack of affordable, accessible and quality early learning and childcare. So can the Prime Minister please tell us how much we are investing in a national childcare program, why it's so important for parents now, and how this will support women right across Canada? Thank you. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Cumberland Colchester for raising this important issue. Child care shouldn't be a luxury. It should be something that everyone can afford. Exactly. That's why Budget 2021 commits up to $30 billion over five years to build a Canada-wide child care system. This plan aims to cut fees by 50 per cent by the end of next year. And in five years, we aim to reach an average of $10 a day daycare right across the country. We look forward to working with all the provinces and territories to ensure that all Canadians have access to early learning and child care. The Honourable Member for Carlton. Sorry about the yeah, no In the UK, restaurants are starting to reopen. In New Zealand, in Australia, they're accepting international travellers without a quarantine. In the US, large gatherings for sports and music events are starting to resume safely. But here in Canada, there's a major third wave. How come Canada is in such a negative position with respect to our other international allies? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there are many Canadians who are going through very tough times right now during this third wave. But we also recognize that there are places in Canada that aren't facing a third wave whether it's the Atlantic provinces or the work the federal government did with the, them that allowed them to have a different reality during this pandemic, or also in the north. We worked with the ministers of the territories so that this pandemic would be different for them. There are other areas that need more help, but the government will be there for Ontario and for other places that do need our assistance. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Vaccines. Yeah. That was the one job he had at this point in the crisis. Now he tries to throw on a cape and says he's the hero that's going to solve the problem that he caused. Yeah. The reality is the rest of the world was being vaccinated in January and February. Vaccination rates in the U.S. and U.K. are twice what they are here in Canada. The rest of the world is reopening while we're being confined to our basements because of the wave of the variants that this Prime Minister allowed. Why did the rest of the world have access to vaccines in January and February while we did not? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, it should come as no surprise that that particular member has a way of inventing facts. Uh, the reality is we did get vaccines in January and February, unlike what the member is saying. But yes, indeed, we need to continue to increase it. Although for January, February, March, we actually surpassed our target of 6 million vaccines uh, by almost 9.5 million vaccines total. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, we will continue 
continue to deliver vaccines to Canadians as quickly as possible. We are now third in the G20 in terms of uh, number of citizens vaccinated uh, with at least one dose. We will continue to accelerate our vaccination. Honourable Member for Carleton. Inventing facts. This from the Prime Minister who has been embarrassed again on the international stage for stating falsehoods. Let me state, let me quote the Independent of London. The Canadian Prime Minister has bizarrely claimed that the UK is facing a very serious third wave of COVID-19, despite cases in Britain currently being much lower than in Canada. So he spreads misinformation here at home and embarrasses us abroad, well, he should be apologizing for his colossal failure to deliver vaccines. Why weren't Canadians vaccinated in January and February like everyone else? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. I've, I've answered that question, but it is fascinating to me that the uh, former member, uh, uh, who uh, the former finance critic of the Conservative Party, the now critic for jobs and growth, has absolutely nothing to say about our federal budget. We just put forward an ambitious plan for jobs, uh, jobs and growth that I'm quite aware that the Conservatives have taken issue with, but they are choosing to not use this opportunity for debate, for discussion in this House of Commons uh, to ask. And I know the member from Carleton never shies away from debate, but why isn't he asking any questions about our plan to grow the economy? Is it because it's that good? The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, it's because I looked through it and there was no plan for jobs or for growth to debate. All he's done is lock down the businesses that provide the jobs and growth. He's locked them down through his failure and his failure alone to deliver the vaccines that are opening up economies around the world. The President of the United States said every single adult in America is now eligible for vaccines. Here in Canada, we haven't even had 30 vaccines per 100 people. That is the contrast. So if he wants to know why we have 300,000 missing jobs and so many people seeing the end of their lives as a result of COVID-19, it's because of his failure. Why didn't we get vaccinated in January and February like everyone else? Sure. The right honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I now understand why the member for Carleton is not asking questions about the budget. He hasn't actually read the budget. So let me inform him uh, that in this budget, we're extending emergency supports to bridge Canadians and Canadian businesses through to recovery. We're extending employment insurance sickness benefits from 15 to 26 weeks. We're revitalizing Canada's tourism sector with a billion dollar investment. We're funding to enhance initiatives like the Black Entrepreneurship Program and the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy. We're establishing a $15 minimum wage, enriching the Canada workers' benefit, investing in our small businesses and the transformation and supports they're going to need for the future. Mr. Speaker, this is a jobs and growth budget and we are all apparently very proud of it in this House. The Honourable Member for Joliet. Mr. Speaker, one of the Prime Minister's key commitments in the budget is for universal child care. He's taking his cue from Quebec, which became a global pioneer in this area when Parlene Morois of the Parti Québécois created our daycare centres in 1997. Since the Prime Minister himself is basing himself on Quebec, would it be not be natural for him to not dictate to Quebec what to do with its share of the money it's owed? Students don't correct teachers. So can the Prime Minister confirm that Quebec will receive its fair share of its funding without conditions? Without strings? That's the question. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, for Quebecers have shown for quite some time the path to follow with respect to daycare centres and for early childhood learning. We know that it's not just the right thing to do, but it's also the intelligent thing to do for the economy, for fairness and for opportunities and economic growth. That's exactly why we're going to bring forward what we all have learned from Quebec across the country. And I would like to reassure you that Budget 2021 will have an assembly plan with Quebec to allow for other improvements to its system. The right, the Honourable Member for Joliet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we want to know is will this agreement have strings or not? What Quebec wants is no conditions at all. We want a confirm confirmation of this. Will there be conditions or not? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for several years now, we've been investing billions, uh, tens of millions 
across the country to increase daycare systems across the country. And every time we were able to get along very well with Quebec to send funds there so that we can invest in families and children. And certainly, Mr. Speaker, the work we're going to do with Quebec together to meet the needs of families across the country and with the investment we're going to send to Quebec so that Quebec can invest properly. Well, we're very happy to be able to ag agree with Quebec on this, and we sure that will happen. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Transparency and humility. Since the beginning, the Prime Minister has said that he's made no mistakes in terms of the vaccine supply for Canadians. But unfortunately, he is responsible for the third wave that we're going through right now in Canada. Eight million cases new day on a, a day on average. Quebecers are under a curfew that restricts their freedom of movement. They can't see their families. Today, the prime minister, if he had done his done proper, had done his job properly last year, we wouldn't be here today. So why did he fail uh, Canadians by not giving them the vaccines they needed in January and February? Mr. Speaker, once again, let's focus on the facts. In the first months of the year, we promised Canadians. Six million vaccines, and we delivered 9.5 million vaccines, Mr. Speaker, and we're delivering them. But we know we have to work hard every day to deliver even more vaccines across the country. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Since the beginning of the question period, the Prime Minister has talk is talking about his targets with respect to vaccine supplies. Who established these targets? Him. Where are the contracts showing that these targets are based on something? We don't have the right to see them. And who doesn't believe him? Canadians, and not just Canadians. Restaurant owners, such as La Bourgade, in my writing, who had to shutter their doors. Children who don't have a social, a social life because they have to go to Zoom school. How come he didn't do his job in January and February? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, small and medium business owners across the country were able to benefit from unprecedented support that the federal government sent them. And yes, eight out of every $10 across the country in assistance during this pandemic was directly given from the federal government. We were there for families, we were there for students, and we're also there for small business owners, and we're going to continue to do so even as we unroll vaccines in Audible. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Mr. Speaker, if we'd had the vaccines, we wouldn't have to be giving small businesses loans now. If we'd had the vaccines earlier, we wouldn't have a curfew in Quebec, and people would be able to see each other. People, children would be able to go to school. If we had the vaccines like the U.S. did, people would have had two vaccines. And now the Prime Minister is proud. Well, there were 200 million Americans vaccinated in 100 days. How come he didn't deliver for Canadians in January and February, instead of putting us in the third bag we're experiencing right now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, since the beginning of this pandemic, we're working to help Canadians, to support small businesses, to support families, and to create a vaccination strategy for the most, the highest number of Canadians as quickly as possible. And we're going to continue to increase the vaccine rollout speed every week in Canada, and we're going to have everyone vaccinated before the end of September fully. And there are many provinces that will be able to vac vaccinate Canadians with the first dose uh, before the beginning of summer. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue our work, and we have to keep holding up during this third wave. The Honourable Member for Marco Relfortin. Mr. Speaker, a senior's age they face increased financial vulnerability, especially women. We know that seniors over 75 years of age are often unable to work. They have disabilities and they have greater health needs. With higher expenses and lower incomes, seniors over 75 
need additional support. Can the Prime Minister explain what our government is doing to make life more affordable for aging Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I'd like to thank Mr. Speaker, my colleague from Marc Aurel Fortin for his hard work on behalf of seniors. Seniors are more likely to have depleted savings, to have disabilities, and to be widows while their health care needs are rising. In bu the Budget 2021, we kept our promise by increasing old age security by 10 percent for Canadians aged 75 years and over. We will also support them in the short term with a one-time payment of $500 in August. Seniors built Canada and they can rest assured that we will always be there for them. For Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Lido Lakes. When confronted with facts, this Prime Minister screams out that it's fake news, but he justifies Canada going off label on the vaccines with a four month dosing, saying that the Brits did the same when in fact they used a three month dosing interval. So instead of spreading misinformation, can the Prime Minister stand up and admit that Canada is in its third wave of lockdowns because he failed to deliver enough vaccines for Canadians to get both doses in January? January and February. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, a year ago there was no COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, now there are many. And Canada, because of our procurement strategy, uh, ha was able uh, to sign deals with seven different potential vaccine makers, many of which are able now to deliver vaccines, including to Canada. We continue to increase the pace of vaccinations arri vaccine doses arriving in Canada. Indeed, in about a week and a half, we will switch to more than 2 million doses of vaccines arriving every single week. We will have close to 50 million vaccine doses by the end of June here in Canada. Mr. Speaker, we are on track to get through this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, it's a real shame that this Prime Minister says that with only 2.5% of Canadians fully vaccinated that we're on track. This third wave is his failure. Residents in my riding can look across the border and see Americans in New York State who can get vaccinated uh, at 16 years of age at their will because they have availability of supply. This is the third wave of COVID, the third wave of lockdowns because this Prime Minister failed to get enough vaccines for Canadians. Instead of making deals with the Chinese-owned CanSino, why didn't this Prime Minister focus on doing what was best for Canadians and getting vaccines for January and February? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, it's important that in this House we base our debate in facts. And in January and February, we did deliver hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses uh, to Canadians. And indeed, by the end of March, by the end of the first quarter, we had surpassed our, our provisions, our scheduled deliveries of 6 million vaccines by uh, a total of 9.5 million vaccines. We recognize there is much more to do, but as of uh, right now, Mr. Speaker, over 25% of Canadians have received at least one dose of uh, the vaccine, uh, and we are on our way uh, to getting through this pandemic. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, I guess this Prime Minister hopes that Canadians will accept uh, that he will uh, under-promise and over-deliver up to 2.5% of Canadians being fully vaccinated. I can tell you, I can tell the Prime Minister through you, Speaker, that's not good enough. This Prime Minister shut down Parliament during a pandemic, had his members filibuster the Health Committee, Defence Committee, Ethics Committee, Procedure and House Affairs, instead of working together in a Team Canada approach to vaccinate Canadians. This third wave is a failure of this Prime Minister. 25% of Canadians getting their first dose is not enough to stop the third wave. Why did this Prime Minister let us down? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, one of the things that has been strong and remarkable is the level of collaboration we've seen across political parties and indeed across orders of government. That's what Canadians have wanted to see, people working together, like the federal government has consistently consistently been there to support the provinces and territories as we make it through the various waves uh, and as we face far too many tragedies. That's why eight out of every ten dollars of support for the, through the families through this pandemic came from the federal government. We have continued to step up every step of the way and we will continue to. We know we need to continue to work together. Nobody wants to see the partisan attacks that uh, are being demonstrated now. They want to see us all working together, which we will.
The Honourable Member for Niagara Centre. Mr. Speaker, we are in the midst of this third wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Canadians need support now, and they need reassurance that the economy will be strong and jobs will be created once we are through this pandemic. Could the Prime Minister update this House on how Budget 2021 will support all Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the member for my Niagara Centre for his important question. This budget is about finishing the fight against COVID-19 and it's about creating prosperity for Canadians. Budget 2021 is a historic investment to address the wounds of COVID-19, put people first, create jobs, set businesses on a track for growth and ensure that Canada's future will be more equitable, greener and more prosperous. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister in his budget is proposing to cut assistance to people this summer. How come we're in the midst of a third COVID-19 wave and we're still under lockdown? We really want people not to lose their jobs. Why is the Liberal government and the Prime Minister proposing to cut assistance this summer from $500 to $300. Why? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, at every stage we were there for Canadians. We made a promise to be there as long as it would take with all the necessary assistance. And we are here and we're going to continue to be there to support families, companies, workers and all Canadians. We all have great hope that when the summer comes, we'll be able to have fewer restrictions and more economic activity. And we know that employers will want to rehire people. And that's why we've invested in an incentive for em employers to hire more people. And we're always going to look at things carefully to make sure we're there to help Canadians as they, when they need us.